Welcome to the April 27th, 2022 meeting of the Parks and Recreation Commission. This is a teleconference meeting with commission members, city staff, and members of the public participating remotely. I'd like to introduce staff and commission members present. Commissioners present include Commissioner Joshua, Commissioner Diepenbrock, Commissioner Brosnan, Commissioner Bryman, and Commissioner Thomas. And staff present includes Library and Community Services Director Sean Reinhardt, Assistant Library Services Director Nick Shegda, Acting Assistant Community Services Director Rondell Howard. And that's everyone. Nick is also the staff liaison for the commission. Nick, will you please take a moment and provide instructions to the commission and members of the public in attendance on how the meeting will proceed. Thank you, Chair Thomas. At various points throughout the meeting tonight, uh, the chair will call for a public comment on items. At that point, if you'd like to make a public comment, um, use the raise hand function at the bottom of your Zoom screen, or if you're dialing in, press star nine on your phone, that will activate your virtual hand. Um, once the chair has called for comment and you have raised your hand, um, I'll call your name and I'll sort of help you over the wall to make your comment. Uh, public comment is limited to three minutes per item. Uh, please clearly state your name and uh, the city where you live for the record. Um, commissioners, please keep your cameras on and microphones off until recognized by the chair. Back to you, Chair Thomas. Thank you, Nick. Do we have any public comments? So at this time, if you would like to make a comment on an item not listed on the agenda, that's on an item not listed on the agenda, uh, please use that raise hand function now. And I see one hand raised. Uh, Alan Bedwell, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and address the commission. Hi, thank you, Commissioners. My name is Alan Bedwell. I'm a member of uh, Friends of Bedwell Bayfront Park and want to uh, just provide you with some general comments uh, that are tied to a few items on the agenda. And I thought it'd be better just to talk at the beginning since uh, they're not associated with any one aspect of the agenda. Um, the Friends was actively involved uh, with the Bedwell Bayfront Master Plan process and we're still active advocates uh, of the park. Um, and with the commission re-engaging on, on your work plan, uh, the friends want to take this opportunity to signal our interest in wanting to engage and support the commission and the city staff on moving forward with implementation of priority aspects of the Bedwell Bayfront Master Plan. So we appreciate your consideration in that as you not only work on your, uh, as you develop your work plan and finalize that, but also as you look towards uh, the uh, capital improvement budget and some of the other aspects of um, uh, planning for parks and recs this year. Um, and we appreciate the fact that after COVID's obviously sort of derailed everything for the last two years, but one of the things that the friends have seen as have the uh, commission and, and the city uh, we saw a, a historic level of use of the park during the last two years uh, during COVID. And the park has uh, both been a, a great resource to residents during that time, but it is also showing a lot of wear and tear due to that higher use. Uh, plus also too, you know, we've seen some economic distortions that have impacted uh, the city's ability to move forward with, the, with uh, implementing aspects of the master plan Plus also we're concerned about service levels of the park ranger vendor uh, being able to staff uh, park rangers um, at a staffing, you know, being able to find people and staff that position. Um, we've noticed an absence in the ranger there. But what we really want to do, we're not here to complain, we're actually here to signal is our support and interest in engaging uh, to help support the commission and the staff on key elements to implement for the master plan to help the park not only manage its higher use, but also help recover from some of the impacts it's received. And some of the things that we've identified as priorities by the friends 
are things like just making sure that there's updates to park information, both online and at the park, um, outreach and enforcement of uh, dog leash requirements and uh, no drones. Now, obviously with uh, everybody on hiatus during COVID, there's not been a lot of outreach or consistent messaging on that. And that's you know, something that's not the city's fault or anybody's fault, it's just the fact of how we've been operating under COVID. Uh, we do want an update on the range patrol, make sure that we've actually got a ranger in place there because while uh, there's a contract in place, they may have had difficulty filling positions. And then finally, just uh, stabilization of the trails and parking areas that have been highly eroded. Um, and then also just how this all be implemented as the uh, post levy, uh, as the restoration work on the levies wraps up uh, because we know that's been delayed as well too. So just in, in conclusion, we, we appreciate your consideration of this. We wanna signal our effort in, in constructively supporting your uh, efforts as a commission to help prioritize your work on, on not only the Federal Bay from Park Master Plan, but also the overall Parks Master Plan as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comment. Anyone else like to make a comment under the public comment period on items not on the agenda? Please use that raise hand function at the bottom of your Zoom screen or press star nine now if you're dialing in. And seeing none, back over to you, Chair Todd. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Bedwell, for that public comment. Um, as Nick mentioned, we're not allowed to uh, comment on anything not on the agenda, um, but your um, your comments have been heard. Uh, at this time, we can move to item D1, uh, which is a presentation on the Realized Flood Park Project. So I will hand it over to Nicholas Calderon. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having me uh, tonight. My name is Nicholas Calderon. I am the director of the San Mateo County Parks Department. Um, uh, Sean, great to see you. And uh, it is great to get to see the uh, commission today. I have been before uh, the commission a couple times to talk about um, uh, this project and, and where we are now is really an exciting uh, part of the project. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so I may uh, provide this uh, brief PowerPoint presentation. But I will also admit that technology is not my strong suit. So if you can't see my screen, if you can just let me know. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yes. Awesome. I'm, I'm seeing head nod. So that's perfect. Uh, here we go. Uh, so realize flood park. So this is a project that started really all the way back in 2015. The San Mateo County Parks Department conducted a, an assessment of Flood Park and really determined that all of the facilities uh, and infrastructure really needed to be upgraded. And so this is what led to the creation of the reimagined Flood Park uh, process. And so this was a multi-year public engagement process that engaged with uh, the public to understand what is your vision for how Flood Park can be used? And what is your vision for how you want to engage and use Flood Park? And, and um, what is your vision for the future? And using this robust public engagement process, the community identified really five key priorities. One was creating, um, creating a, a, a community gathering space. It was uh, in, using innovative technology. Uh, it was a, preserving existing trees. It was expanding types of uses and it was promoting healthy lifestyles. And so those were really the overarching five themes that are goals that really drove the project. And so uh, after uh, having a landscape plan that was reviewed by CEQA. Uh, it went to the Board of Supervisors and the Board of Supervisors at the time asked us to go back and make some revisions to accommodate um, some of the concerns at the time expressed by neighbors. And it was primarily where you see the tennis courts right now, 
there was a, a soccer field. And so there was concerns regarding noise and, and impacts. And so we went back to the drawing board and we looked at those five priorities and we looked at all the feedback from the community. And, and this was the revision that was made. And we, uh, we adjusted our CEQA analysis based on this new project, brought that back to the Board of Supervisors uh, and the Board of Supervisors certified that document and adopted this landscape plan. And so once that was done, that kicked off the design process, right? So this is the concept phase. And then that kicked off the design process. And, and so um, while we were at the time reimagining Flood Park, we like to look at it as now we are realizing Flood Park. And so that's that's why we've we've changed the name to the Realized Flood Park Project. And the I think it's really important to clarify or, or, or explain that this landscape plan was the base. This is what we're starting with. And then we're engaging with the public to say, okay, looking at this, how do we start getting into the details? And how do we start looking at finalizing things like where amenities need to be located? And how do you actually um, locate amenities in proximity to one another when they support each other or have a, a synergy? And then when is it appropriate to put amenities further away from each other? And I think really the best example is if you look at number four right here, this is the existing Adobe administration building that's at the park. And this is something that through the, the multi-year public engagement process, we had conversations about, can this be used for community events? And things like farmers markets or art, uh, you know, art and wine fairs, things like that. And uh, the answer was, yeah, you know, we, we think that would, would work. But if we're going to do something like that, we probably should have a reservation site with picnic tables and other amenities nearby so that, you know, those, those two amenities could support one another. I think another great example is we have a, um, an adventure play, which is more of like a natural play area here at eight and then a playground here at seven. Well, those probably should be located closer to each other. So if, you know, a parent has two kids and one wants to go one direction, one wants to go the other way, you know, how do we, how do we bring those together? So that's really what this design process is for. So, um, so the design process really launched in uh, January, at the end of 2021, when our consultants started reviewing the documents and getting up to speed on everything. And then in February, we hosted our first project design workshop. And uh, that was a, a virtual workshop. And we really gathered um, some good feedback from that workshop. And uh, we also recognized that not everyone wants to participate in a process by participating in a workshop. Some people um, are more comfortable sharing their ideas um, through a survey. Not everyone wants to speak, uh, virtually speaking, in front of, of a group of individuals. So we then released uh, a survey, and this survey was open from March 12th through March 31st. And we received, uh, you know, over uh, almost 800 surveys. I mean, it, it was really uh, survey responses. It was really a great uh, great showing. And uh, we just published the survey results yesterday. So, um, uh, so I'm, ex I'm really excited to be able to share some of that with you. Um, but before I jump into that, what I want to kind of clarify is the way where you're going to use this survey information. So what we're now going to do is take the survey information and we're going to look at that baseline landscape plan that um, I previously showed this one. And we're going to say, what is the what are the results of the surveys tell us, and what needs to be adjusted here? And so that's why that survey results the survey results are so important because, um, like Menlo Park, right? We are a government agency, and we have um, the public process to guide our decision making and to inform our decisions. And so uh, what we're doing now is we're looking at the survey results and we're saying what adjustments need to be made. So here's some of the, the uh, these are not all of the survey questions that were asked. These are some that I, I thought um, the, the commission would be interested in seeing. Uh, and at the end, I provide the link for the overall uh, web page, but I wanna walk through this briefly. So here you can see 
a, a breakdown of the age range for who um, is responding to the survey. And, um, uh, and then here you get to really have a sense of what it is, what features are users most excited about and, and really get a, a sense of how people want to use the park. And so certainly uh, what we're seeing is these nat the natural areas of the park are uh, clearly hugely popular with 63%. Uh, and the picnic areas with 60% of respondents saying that they're looking forward to using those features. Uh, what we also are able to uh, identify through these results is that there is overall a large number of survey respondents who are excited about the active recreational opportunities that are gonna be presented, right? So 37% uh, are excited that we're gonna have our the first all abilities playground in a San Mateo County park. Uh, but also, you know, there's a lot of individuals who are excited, uh, you know, over a third who wanna use the multi-sports fields and, and over uh, what almost a quarter wanna use the baseball fields and the pump track, which this is gonna be the second pump track in the San Mateo County Park system. And we're really excited about that. We think this is a growing trend in, in popular recreational uh, amenities. And we really think that the community is gonna love that opportunity. Um, I learned actually the last time I was before this group um, that pickleball is the fastest growing sport in America. Um, and so we will be having a tennis court pickleball uh, court at Flood Park and uh, really excited. You know, I, it was interesting when I was before this group last time and a speaker was talking about uh, pickleball courts. It was really uh, we had already been talking about it, but it was really an eye opener uh, for me. So really excited to be able to have that as part of this project. Uh, and then we get to look at how people want to use Flood Park. I mean, what are the activities? and um, what you're able to see is really a lot of individuals are looking to exercise, to be healthy, to be active at Flood Park. And I think that's something that, um, I think that's awesome. I mean, I, earlier someone was talking about kind of how, um, how the pandemic has changed how, how people are using parks. I will tell you at San Mateo County Parks, we're, our numbers are through the roof right now. And, um, and it's awesome. And it's exactly what we want to see. Um, and so for us to be able to provide a park like the, the future flood park will be uh, when that's determined, we're really excited about. And then again, you can see the different types of uses that uh, individuals will want to use the, um, the multi-use sports field for. You know, uh, almost two thirds are looking forward to using it for soccer and, and over 40% are looking forward to having that um, rehabilitated baseball, softball field. Uh, but also a large number of individuals just looking for somewhere to go and play a pickup game. I, mean, I, I know for myself growing up, that was one of the, the probably the number one thing my friends and I did at a park um, uh, was just go and play, you know, play baseball, play soccer, play football. That was just kind of how we, we spent our time. Uh, and then this is really important because what it tells us is there's really a, a, a demand for space for organized league play, as well as this informal and drop-in play. And I think that's something that is really driving us during this process is recognizing that uh, it's really important to have space that is programmed, but it's also really important to have space that um, family and friends can drop in and play pickup games and that siblings can go to the park and, and kick a soccer ball around, throw a football around somewhere where Kids can be kids, friends can be friends, families can be families. And so that's something that we're really committed to is making sure that when this new project gets implemented and the park opens, that we're not just programming everything to the max. We really want to make this a place where someone can wake up on a Saturday without any plans and decide they want to go to the park and have fun. And that's really important for us. Um, and then here just kind of breaks down the size of fields that uh, individuals are looking for, and certainly, you know, a, a lot are looking for that large size. But what I really take away from this is that uh, over 50% are looking for more of those smaller size fields, um, which really support youth sports as well as that informal drop and play. Um, I'm not sure about any of you. If I'm with my friends, you're not going to get me to run on an 80 by 120 yard field. I'm not going to make it very long in that game. 
Um, so, you know, I certainly would lean towards one of those smaller fields uh, if I was doing a pickup game as well. Really important to this project is the preservation of existing trees. And what you can see here is um, a huge number uh, of individuals, uh, almost a third, asking to preserve heritage trees. And I do want to be clear that, um, you know, so we are the County of San Mateo. We use the County of San Mateo uh, ordinance code and definitions. And so we are not impacting any heritage trees as defined by the county. Um, I know that there will maybe there may be some who uh, call out that the city of Menlo Park and the county of San Mateo have a different definition for that, and, and that's that is very true. Uh, but using the county's definition, we are not impacting any heritage trees. Uh, there's also a large desire to preserve the trees at the heart of the oak woodland, and that's something that was a, a common theme at the workshop. It's a common theme here in the survey, and we hear that loud and clear. Uh, and then, of course, there's also um, interest in, in making sure that the park has habitat value for wildlife and that we're finding a strong balance between preserving native trees and allowing more park uses. Um, and and uh, certainly not a surprise here, people love to picnic at Flood Park. Um, we know that right now, uh, we know that that's gonna continue and uh, we have committed to not reducing the quantity or capacity at picnic and reservation sites. So we're gonna maintain the existing number and we're gonna, we're gonna maintain the capacity at the park. So um, one, one slide that I didn't include in here that I think is interesting, I'd certainly encourage everyone to go look at uh, the overall data collected was looking at the size of picnic and reservation sites that uh, individuals are interested in using and um, it really emphasizes the need to have um, smaller sites instead of larger sites. And that's gonna be a design challenge for us. Again, we have maintained that we are not going to reduce the number or capacity of picnic and reservation sites. Um, but it begs the question, does that mean we should um, design spaces that could essentially serve as one reservation site or serve as two, um, you know, if it's a hundred person site, is that only to be used for one party of up to 100 or could that be broken out to be used by two parties of 50? Those are things that we're really gonna have to evaluate. Um, I don't have an answer for you today, but that's what the value of these uh, surveys are is they, they beg these questions. So again, here's where we are uh, in the, the process. So we will be hosting a public workshop in early June, at which point we will be rolling out revisions to the um, landscape plan. So again, we're gonna take the data that was collected from the survey and we're going to revise that landscape plan uh, so that the project reflects the different values and priorities and wants of the public. And we'll be rolling that out this summer. And then uh, we'll be hosting further opportunities to engage with the public uh, before proceeding with the, the detailed designs of that. So. Uh, we're, we're still at the, the beginning of the uh, uh, we're still at the beginning of the uh, design phase, uh, but really looking forward to to making those revisions, getting the the project um, to reflect the values of those surveys, and and move into the detailed design phase. Um, so this is the link at the bottom, uh, which is parks.smcgov.org uh, backslash realize flood park. And if you go to this website and you look for the subscribe for updates and you put your information in, you will automatically receive emails um, from us when there are project updates. And it's certainly the best way to um, receive accurate, up-to-date uh, information on the project. And it's where we put all the official information and data. So uh, anyone interested in following this project, certainly uh, the best and most effective way of following that is going to be through this uh, through this opportunity here before you at uh, at our official website. Um, with that said, I'm happy to answer any questions that uh, the commission may have. Thank you, Mr. Calderon. Um, really exciting opportunity to renovate Flood Park. And we'll, I'm sure we'll have a lot of uh, questions from the commission, but before we get to those, 
Uh, Assistant Director Shegda, do we have any public comment on this item? Thank you, Chair Thomas. At this time, if anyone would like to make a public comment on item uh, D1, the presentation on Realize Flood Park, please use that raise hand function at the bottom of your screen, your Zoom screen, or if you're dialing in, press star nine now. I see one public comment so far. It's from Bernard Klaus. Mr. Klaus, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and address the commission. Oh, hi, thank you. And uh, thank you for that great update. Uh, just one real quick comment on the, the survey. Um, the definition of a heritage tree, I, I think that was lost on some of the survey takers. And so I, I can imagine some people choosing that, thinking of a broader definition of heritage trees. And I, I think there might be a larger interest in preserving you know, all of the trees, as many as possible. Maybe the woodland question would have risen up higher if people knew what that definition is. But, uh, other than that, it was a great opportunity to do the survey and, and really appreciated the, the interest in collecting that. So thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. Would anyone else like to make a comment on item D1, the presentation on Realize Flood Park? If so, use that raise hand function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Press star nine if you're dialing in. Excuse me. Not seeing any more public comment on this item. So back over to you, Chair Thomas. Thank you, Nick. Um, we'll open this up to the commission and I see Commissioner Bryman's hand uh, patiently waiting, so I'll hand it off to him. Nicholas, thank you so much. That was a that was a great update and a, a, a really nice uh, presentation. I we we don't live too far from Flood Park, not as close as some of our dear friends, and I know it's a project that most, if not all, of the community is very excited about. Um, so I really appreciate you guys working on this. Um, I had a couple of questions when I was looking at the, the conceptuals. You made mention, for example, and we've talked about this a lot on the commission, about uh, sort of pickleball being this, this up and coming sport and that people are really loving it. Um, I happen to be a tennis player and have a lot of conversations with tennis players all around the city. Um, I know this is a county situation, not a city situation, but uh, you kind of put the two together or the, the county seems to be putting the two together. And I'm only seeing two total courts on that design. Is the concept to not only just have two courts, but then to split those two courts between pickleball and tennis? Is that sort of the idea? Through the chair, Commissioner, uh, I apologize, I guess maybe a rules of order question. Would you like me to address one at a time or would you like me to wait until all of them? I just wanna be respectful of the commission's procedures. Sure, thank you. I think it'd be best if you addressed one at a time. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Commissioner, that is correct. We will be, uh, it's, it's two uh, courts and the, they will be shared between the two uses. Understood. I, um, this is something I was going to bring up from a city perspective. Um, I was uh, I was on a trip not too long ago, and there were some dedicated pickleball courts. Uh, I was in Utah at the time, and uh, just I, I know it's very popular. I, I play uh, often at Nilon, and just the, the the sort of the temporary nature of these painted lines and things. It's Again, I'm a tennis player. I, I played pickleball. I, I don't consider myself a pickleball player. Nevertheless, I, I'd like to be able to sort of honor each sport in and of itself 
um, to share two seems pretty tight. I, I, I was going to mention this with respect to uh, Menlo Park City courts, but I, I think if we're going to go all in on this pickleball thing, I think we should probably think about de delivering a dedicated pickleball court, just build a pickleball court and not have to sort of, you know, uh, share the, the limited number of courts that, uh, that exist. I mean, two for tennis alone is not a lot. Um, to share the two seems, seems a little tight to me. I know the parks can get a lot, get a lot more use and it's, it's a lot of land. It, it would seem that if we're going to go through that trouble that anyway, and maybe that's just a comment that I'll make as a, as a citizen. But um, the other question is this, I was on the uh, Menlo Park Little League board for many, many years. And we did something in at Holbrook Palmer Park in Atherton. We built a new, a, a new field there. And we came up with a strategy so that we could we could share the, the ball field uh, and also have a, a dedicated field, which is with a temporary fence. And I saw that sort of a, a drawing of the outline of the outfield. Um, is there, are there plans to put a temporary fence there for just baseball season so that it's, it's not only safer for people who are, you know, out there while the ball is being hit, um, but it also kind of creates a little bit more of a, a formality to the field, not one that should live there permanently, but something that is um, when the season is over, it, it, it can open up and then it, everybody can use it. I'm sorry, that was a question. Is, is there? Yeah. I, sorry, Commissioner. I, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I was hitting the mute button. I think I, I ended up muting myself instead of unmuting myself. So I apologize. Yeah, no, Commissioner. The fence, because the baseball diamond will share space with the multi-use field, which will be overlaid in the outfield, very, very uh, similar to what many jurisdictions do, that outfield fence will have to be uh, a, a portable system. So a system that will be able to be put up when that area is being used as a baseball field and taken down when it's being used as a multi-use field. Yeah, that, that's what I was sort of aiming at, but that it will exist. There will be that temporary nature, if you will. Yes, sir. That there will be a physical, when it's being used as a baseball field, um, at this point in time, uh, we the intention is entirely for there to be uh, a, a fence. We have not had any conversations internally, externally, or with any stakeholders that would indicate otherwise, or that would, that would lead us to believe that otherwise was, was appropriate. Thank you so much. I believe uh, Commissioner Joshua is next. Nicholas, thank you for that presentation. It was, it was very informative. And, you know, I've always looked at Flood Park as being one of those underutilized resources on the peninsula. And it's really, really good to see that we've got a plan going, in, you know, that we're putting in place to, to really utilize it for the community benefit. A couple of questions. Um, one thing you didn't talk about, and I know it's probably early to be talking about it, but what's the, what's the timeline? Um, and I think there's various phases that this is going to be going through. Um, tentatively, how do you see that progressing over the next few years? To the chair commissioner, uh, the intention is to have the designs presented to the board of supervisors for adoption the end of 2022 or early 2023. Uh, naturally, with any project of this size and magnitude, there are uh, various opportunities for delays, but it is very much a project that we would like to get to the board you know, realistically by the end of this year or early next year. Okay, thank you. Um, second question has to do with the field space um, uh, and uh, water usage um, and the uh, surfaces that you're going to be using on the fields. Uh, do you anticipate using um, artificial turf or natural grass? Commissioner, that's a conversation we still need to have with the public. Uh, once we lock down field look, excuse me, field location, field size, we're gonna be able to start talking about uh, field material, artificial versus natural. Uh, also, the San Francisco Public Utility Commission 
has a has a, a pipeline that runs through the park. And so whatever we end up doing is going to have to meet their design standards. And so that will also weigh into the determination as to whether it's artificial or natural. There was, a, there was a time a little while ago there was artificial turf that was lying around that area that was supposedly going to be used. Has that been removed or? Commissioner, that was relocated elsewhere uh, in our system. And, and I believe we might have even given some to uh, a couple of organizations in the county. Um, I think we had uh, some hopes for what we'd be able to do with that, uh, but it just was not something that ended up working out. Yeah, I think it was substandard to say the least in terms of. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay, I'll, I'll go next. Um, yeah, thank you again, Mr. Calderon. Uh, ex an exciting presentation and kind of, um, I guess, piques the imagination for, for what will you know end up uh, manifesting there. Um, you know, I really like how you've been engaging with the community and doing this survey. And oftentimes, surveys you know answer some questions, and then they spawn you know additional questions. And I guess. Um, one question I have looking at, at the data is I always see like two components. So there is kind of a component I see um, that um, is perhaps uh, older, you know, so the um, largest uh, demographic bin is 46 through 65. Um, the activities that they're most excited about are um, the top two are uh, natural areas and picnic areas. And um, yeah, I believe one of the, the surveys also um, showed that you know, a lot of people want to be in nature. And then on the other side, there's this interest in having you know, another field and, and more programming. And so I was wondering, like, for this particular issue, if there's any conflict between those that might want to keep the oak woodland, keep it more like a natural area versus those that would prefer um, you know, the ballpark. I think it was 16 on your um, design, the soccer field and lacrosse field. And so I guess my question is, one, is there a tension there? And two, would you ever consider a, a, like structuring the survey such that um, people would have to weigh in on this tension? So it's kind of like an either or to really kind of tease out the dominant preference? Yeah, I, I don't, sorry, Chair, uh, I don't think it needs to be an either or. Flood Park, uh, for a long time, hosted the only public pool in San Mateo County. Flood Park used to host minor league baseball games, right? So, but Flood Park also uh, has beautiful native oaks. And, uh, and I, don't, I don't think that it needs to be a one or the other. And based on what the public has told us, since 2015, I don't see uh, them seeing it as needing to be one or the other. Um, I think there is a way in which we can balance the two and have the two um, complement one another. And so that's really what we're going to set out to do, is we're going to set out to have a park that provides really high quality special, um, awesome recreational opportunities like the pump track and tennis courts and pickleball courts and multi-use fields and the baseball field. But we're also going to preserve the trees and we're going to make sure that if a group wants to have a picnic um, in a more natural setting, that that is certainly an opportunity that they have. Um, but, but, there, but I don't see there being a need to, to say one or the other. Okay, awesome. Yeah, and thanks for sharing that history. Um, so, so I guess one follow-up on that point. So, so it sounds like the oak woodland can be preserved and the new ball field um, can be kind of put in place. So, so I just want to clarify that like um, putting the kind of soccer and lacrosse field at that location would not require uh, removing any of the oak woodland. Is that correct? So I, I think... Um... There's, there's a term of art at play that's been um, kind of uh, um, that was started to be used by some in the community. It's the heart of the oak woodland. And, and um, it's like I said, it's really a term of art. And that's um, and certainly the that area, which is that 
that central part of the Oak Woodland um, is something that we've heard loud and clear. There's a strong desire to preserve and to, um, uh, uh, to protect. I am very cautious to say that we're not gonna remove any trees from that area. And, and the reason I say that is because uh, I was in the park 10 days ago. There's a lot of non-native trees that are in the area that I would consider to be the heart of the oak woodland. There's a lot of trees that are, um, uh, I, I think the best example, if you go out there, you're gonna see a redwood that looks like a Charlie Brown Christmas tree. Um, it is not a healthy tree, right? And, um, and so, certainly we need to be able to have the flexibility and the ability to look at what are native, what are non-native, what are healthy, what are not healthy. Um, and so I, 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 I give that long-winded answer because I do think there's a way to balance uh, the different uses to preserve the oak woodland, uh, the heart of the oak woodland. Um, but in, when it comes to uh, the type of work we do in, in land management and stewardship, Sometimes you actually have to be removing trees to help other trees thrive and, um, and to create more space for uh, native species. And uh, in that case, that's something that we very much would be um, willing and, and looking to do is, is removing non-natives and replacing those with natives. Okay, that, that makes sense. And again, thank you so much for, for working with you know, the public on this issue since, since 2015. Thank you, Chair. Are there any other questions from commissioners? Uh, if I may, uh, through the chair, I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank Nicholas for taking the time to come out here and talk through this project with us. You know, it's, it's right here in town. And so we're really excited about it. And we're really grateful for the opportunity to, to, to talk with you directly about the latest and greatest with the project. So thank you. Absolutely, and happy to uh, happy to come back and see you all at any time. All right, thanks, Mr. Calderon. Thank you. Uh, you all have a great night. At this time, we can move to our regular business. Uh, the first thing on our agenda is to approve the minutes for the regular meeting of the Parks and Recreation Commission of March twenty third, twenty twenty two. Assistant Director Shagget, do we have any public comment on this item? At this time, if anyone would like to make a comment on item E1, approving the minutes from the March 23rd, 2022 Parks and Recreation Commission meeting, please use that raise hand feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen, or if you're dialing in, press star nine now. And seeing no comments, back to you, Chair Thomas. Okay, do any commissioners have a comment on this item? Seeing none, um, I will go ahead and motion to approve those minutes. Uh, can I get a second? Second. All right, we have a motion made by Chair Thomas and seconded by Commissioner Diepenbrock to approve the minutes from the March 23rd, 2022 Parks and Recreation Commission meeting. I'm gonna go ahead and take a roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner uh, Joshua, how do you vote? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Bryman, how do you vote? I was absent, I'll abstain. Uh, Commissioner Brosnan, how do you vote? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Diepenbrock, how do you vote? Yes. And Chair Thomas, how do you vote? Yes. Uh, the vote uh, measure passes one, two, three, four. Uh, and with uh, Commissioner Baskin absent and Commissioner Bryman abstaining. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. On to item E2. Menlo Park Community Campus Guiding Principles and Operational Milestones. I'll hand it over to Library and Community Services Director, Sean Reinhardt. Okay, uh, thank you. So the commission will recall receiving an informational report about the Menlo Park Community Campus 
guiding principles and operational milestones. And so this evening is the opportunity to, now that folks have had time to kind of look through it and absorb it, uh, to do a quick presentation just to refresh your memory and then uh, welcome any discussion, comments, feedback about it. Uh, very exciting project. There's a lot of great stuff going on in Menlo Park and this is the, I think the most exciting thing of all, which is the new Menlo Park Community Campus. You see here a rendering of what the front uh, entry of the facility will look like. Um, I think you've seen it before, but it's always nice to look at and before long we'll be looking at it in real life. Just as a little bit of background here, um, in December of 2019, Facebook, now Meta, submitted its proposal to build this new facility. In January of 2021, City Council approved the plans for the new facility. So in just a little over a year, uh, during a pandemic, it went from concept to plans being approved. And then six months later in June, construction actually began. Um, so this project is moving with light speed. Um, in March of this year, last month, the, the foundation was poured, uh, quite significant. And then in April uh, this month, um, the steel framework was completed. So if you haven't been down by the site, I encourage you to go check it out. You can see the framework of the building there. It's, it's pretty impressive. You can get a sense of the scale. And then this time next year in 2023, um, uh, we expect to receive certificates of occupancy and opening the facility to the public um, a year from this summer, <clears throat> this summer, so pr pretty exciting and pretty fast. This uh, view of the site is actually old now. Uh, this is from last fall when the site was cleared. You can see Kelly Park Athletic Field in the background there. Uh, the former Oneta Harris Center was more or less in this area, um, and the new center is being built kind of in this this back area here. Uh, this front area is going to augment the existing parking lot. Um, so we're expecting to get a new picture. So maybe next month we'll have one that shows the actual steel framework. We're just looking to get a drone in the sky to do that. Uh, so I just wanted to take a few minutes to talk about the guiding principles uh, for programming and operating this new facility. And these come from city council approved policy statements that have accumulated um, and most recently with the cost recovery policy. This is the city's policy for how much of the cost of providing a service should each service seek to recover, you know, typically through fees or other means. Um, a, a number of our recreation programs do have cost recovery levels. Some are completely subsidized, meaning free to the public. Um, some have a low cost recovery, a nominal fee. Others are you know, at full cost recovery or close to it where basically the entire cost of operating the program you know, there's fees charged to offset that. But in that update that the city council made this past June, uh, they really acknowledge that sometimes when cost recovery is too aggressive, it can create inequity and barriers to access to um, resources that really are public resources, whether they're athletic fields or classes at a recreation center, uh, swimming pools, things like that. So I mean, just finding that balance and ensuring that inclusion, equity, fairness, justice doesn't kind of get lost in the equation of, of just trying to recover cost. So they added this statement, which is that the city of Menlo Park provides services and infrastructure that contribute to quality of life for all Menlo Park residents. And in so doing, the city strives to balance the resources and requirements of each area of the city in an equitable manner for all residents in all neighborhoods of the city. And the city of Menlo Park prioritizes just social justice and decisions that affect residents' lives. The fair, just, and equitable management of all institutions serving the public directly or by contract the fair, just, and equitable distribution of public services and implementation of public policy, and the commitment to promote fairness, justice, and equity in the formation of public policy. So I would, I would consider this one of the more significant guiding principles as we move down the road toward opening the new Menlo Park Community Campus facility and fully realize that vision and ensuring that you know, we preserve all of these elements that are kind of contained here and how we carry that out. Additionally, a uh, number of commissioners will recall, and of course all the commission knows that the Parks and Recreation Facilities Master Plan also contains some statements. This was adopted by the City Council in 2019 after of course the commission did quite a bit of work to prepare this plan, which is about uh, Menlo Park's high quality system of parks and recreation facilities, 
the concept of one Menlo Park um, that as the city grows and evolves, making sure to meet the needs of all members of the community with these facilities, uh, ensure that the system of parks and recreation facilities is equitably distributed, they're active and passive, uh, accessible to residents of all ages and abilities all over the city, that each new Parker facility, such as the MPCC, um, should contribute to satisfying the recreational needs of the neighborhood that it serves, really that hyper-local, but also be integrated into a system that serves the entire community. And each improvement should complement the mix of uses in the neighborhood and in the city as a whole. So just keeping that systemic view, again, being neighborhood serving, and uh, also prioritizing um, approaches that balance community-wide benefits or community benefits with potential neighborhood impacts. So for example, with the MPCC, it's gonna be a major recreation and cultural hub in the city uh, that will bring folks into the facility. We have to also be cognizant that that will have impacts to the neighborhood. And then we wanna make sure that we we're balancing, you know, those benefits with the potential impacts of the neighborhood that they, they may cause. Um, universal design, something the commission is well versed in and how to incorporate that in amenities and ensuring that we have uh, inclusive environments and programs for people of all different abilities, including mental cognitive abilities and so on. Um, so th those are pretty important guiding principles that already exist adopted by the city council and of course vetted by the Parks and Recreation Commission that as we move forward with the uh, operational planning for the MPCC and by extension, how we do things throughout the city's parks and recreation system, it's important to keep these things in mind because they, they kind of set a clear in kind of direction for us to, to move in. Here's just a nice rendering of the back of the facility. This is kind of looking toward the um, after school use center is kind of back behind this door. The children's library is back here. Maker space is upstairs. This shows a little courtyard that's gonna be out there. Uh, here's a mural. This is just a placeholder. Some other artwork will go there. But as you can see, the building's gonna have a really, really lovely interface with, um, in this case, uh, Kelly Field. This is like standing on Kelly Field, basically looking at, at the building from that angle. Um, I won't spend too much time on the estimated milestones. They were contained in the report from last month. Um, but as you can see, they're broken into C, uh, basically quarters. Uh, we're already in spring 2022. There's quite a bit of activity already underway and the commission is beginning to soak in that right now with your tentative agenda calendar. Again, I won't linger on this, but just scroll through to kind of give a sense. Summer will be quite busy with operational planning, program planning, a pretty significant aspect is the aquatic study session and analysis. And something that there's some community interest in is initiating a process for identifying the name of the facility all to begin this summer. Continuing in summer with more policy updates in autumn uh, at city council direction issuing, uh, potentially issuing a request for proposals for an aquatics operator for both pools, the new pool at MPCC and Burgess pool. The current operator would be invited and encouraged to respond to that RFP. But of course, with a new facility, we need to go through that process to identify an operator. Uh, ideally, the plan is for the facility name to be identified in autumn. Uh, then you can see some other make ready starting in autumn for the new facility. Here's a nice look at what the uh, outdoor aquatic center will look like with an instructional pool as well as a performance pool, not shown in this rendering, but it's there is a splash pad for like, you know, tots um, uh, for uh, family access. Um, up above in the community center, up behind on the ground floor is the locker rooms and up above, this is a, there's a fitness center and a movement studio up here with a nice look out at the pool. I can't wait to get in that water. It looks very inviting. Um, moving through autumn, more programming, preparations and policy updates. Uh, I wanna call out that in winter is when we really in earnest start looking at, oops, sorry, um, the Kelly Park field and track renovation. Uh, the Kelly Park field and track were last renovated about 10 years ago and the turf and the track are beginning to show their age. Um, and so it's, it's time to to look at um, renovating those. Uh, we wanna finish the MPCC project, but then immediately pivot to the Kelly Park field and track improvements. And then in spring, we're really getting ready for the grand opening, moving in, 
installing all the furniture and equipment, um, getting the operation started up, and then actually having a grand opening, uh, VIP tours, soft opening, all that great stuff, community tours, then closing out our other locations, the current Bellhaven Branch Library, we're going to move out because we're moving into the new facility. Uh, there's some portables that are housing the after school center, we'll have to deactivate those and move them out. And of course, our senior center is currently co located here at the Ariaga Recreation Center downtown, and with the main library as well, uh, that will move back over to um, the new center. And then we don't want to lose sight of the fact that this will be a state of the art uh, facility um, that will be eligible for various architectural awards and recognitions for our community, as well as certifications related to the energy efficiency, the environmental sustainability features and others. And of course, we want to make sure that we're asking the community, how do you like it? How can we improve it? Um, and so we want to make sure we have surveys. So with that, I'll just end with this rough sketch of the parking lot, uh, which uh, has car will have carports over it, and those will have solar panels on top. That energy will be captured to power the building, and there is a solar microgrid of batteries uh, on site for storing that electricity to then be used, like at nighttime, for example. So, very green facility. That concludes the presentation. It's just kind of to give you a refresher and really look forward to your questions, comments, uh, feedback, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Director Reinhardt. That was a, another very inspiring presentation. Uh, before we get to commissioner questions, uh, Assistant Director Shegda, are there any public comments on this item? Thank you, Chair Thomas. If this time you would like to make a comment on item E2, the Menlo Park Community Campus Guiding Principles and Operational Milestones Report, please use that uh, raise hand function at the bottom of your Zoom screen, or if you're dialing in, press star nine on your phone now. And seeing no comments, Back to you, Chair Thomas. Great, we can open this up to the commission. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll start. I guess, I guess my first comment on that presentation is the photos or sketches are, are pretty incredible. Uh, yeah, I really hope that <laughs> that vision is, is realized. I think that the, the one of a pool, I mean, that, that seemed more like a, a, a resort than a, um, a community facility. So. Be really awesome um, if we can kind of realize the full potential here. Uh, I guess in terms of questions, so it sounds like for, for spring, for this spring, um, so, so I know on the, um, what's it called? Uh, the operations plan that you kind of walked us through, um, a lot of the items are tagged with CC, which um, means it'll kind of come before the city council. And I think the items, the line items that don't aren't um, appended with a CC are, are, are things that uh, you know this commission uh, can be involved with. So I just want to confirm. It seems like for this spring, the best opportunities for us will primarily be around programming. So it seems like the the fitness center, gymnasium, movement studio, library spaces, teen space, and maker space. Um, I, I guess is that consistent with your view, Director uh, Reinhardt? <coughs> Yes, thank you, Chair Thomas. You're correct that the ones that have CC in parentheses indicate that, you know, city council direction or input or awareness at a minimum are kind of a necessity. It doesn't mean that they wouldn't necessarily have input on the other aspects, but that would be required for, for some aspects. Um, and, and you're correct that in, in particular when it comes to like the programming plans, the operations plans, uh, very much in the commission's wheelhouse, and it, it's already in your tentative agenda calendar, including, I believe, a joint meeting with the library commission in June is tentatively scheduled to kind of walk through, you know, some of those elements of, you know, how is the facility going to operate? Let's quickly toggle through into summer. You can see kind of more of that with operations planning and program planning. Um, I think a little bit later, you see some some policy updates. For example, these departmental policy updates is something we typically bring to the commission about facility rentals, about meeting room policies, 
uh, for the library commission, more would be the library collection development policy and so on. So um, it, this, this uh, plan does kind of include the commissions as well as like the city council, basically the public bodies is primarily where the milestones are sort of structured. Uh, by, by extension, because those are all public meetings, of course, those are big opportunities for public engagement and input. Of course. Um, Commissioner Bryman. Hey, Sean, thanks. Uh, thanks for the update. It's just awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited. Um, I, again, back to tennis just for a second. I, I have a friend who lives just, I guess, just west of the freeway. I go to his, I drive to his place and then we'll walk over the bridge into Kelly and often play tennis there. So I've kind of been watching this progress and it's exciting that we're, that we're getting close. It, it's really great. Um, God, what was, <laughs> what was, oh yes. I was wondering if you could speak to just this concept of the balance between the neighborhood and the community at large, if you would. I, I've been hearing some chatter about, well, it's in our backyard, therefore we get to use it first. And, you know, certain people can't come at certain. I mean, I, I, I think you're right. There needs to be this balance. We want to serve the neighborhood. We want to serve the community. It's a public Menlo Park facility. I'm just wondering if, uh, if you could speak to that uh, to some extent. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up and giving another opportunity to delve a little deeper into that. So um, I'll take uh, Kelly Park Field for an example, maybe just sort of illustrating, you know, sort of real world on the ground, kind of what's going on. So in the Bellhaven neighborhood, as you know, um, you know, it's, it's pretty well hemmed in with the railroad corridor on one end of the neighborhood, the 101 freeway on the other side. And then of course, Willow Road, pretty much containing it in a triangle with those, those physical barriers that are kind of there. Um, yes, there's a freeway pedestrian overcrossing and sure you can you know cross roads, but you know they do form a barrier. And, and not only that, but there's this sort of a historic barrier um, about you, you know basically past land use practices and, and basically discriminatory lending and discriminatory housing uh, practices that basically, you know, it, it's known as redlining, uh, in which, you know, people of, of color were really the, the only place that they were really allowed to reside was, was kind of in, in that part of town, which was sort of physically separated from the rest of town by these major infrastructures. And so at the same time, the access to public amenities that were, you know, maybe enjoyed in other parts of town, lovely parks that are kind of within walking distance from the home and all of that was not something that was really available in the Bellhaven neighborhood historically, you know, for, for many years through the 20th century and even into this century. And so, you know, the, the um, so then back to Kelly Park Field, um, the residents in Bellhaven have very few kind of options for parks that have like kind of a lot of green space. Yes, there's some smaller parks there. There's Hamilton Park. There's there's Carly Clark Park, um, but but they're they're pretty small, and so Kelly Park Field is you know it's a pretty good size. It's a big soccer field. It's got a track around it, and so that's all well and good. However because of the nature of that field, it's set up for athletics. It's the only lit field in town, the only one with a track around it like that. Um, what had end up, ended up happening was that it was basically programmed all the time with um, organized athletic groups uh, for which you know fees are charged to participate. And so for neighborhood residents who maybe just wanna engage in some of that more drop-in pickup kind of casual play. The, the amenity was there in their neighborhood, but not really accessible to the people who live there. So I think that, you know, part of that's where part of this, you know, discussion about balance kind of comes from, you know, on the one hand, you know, it does serve the whole city, but just being careful that it doesn't serve the whole city, except the people who live right there. I, ho I hope that's helpful. Um, with respect to the park, and we talked about this with, with respect to the balance between planned and unplanned stuff, that I think that that's absolutely on target. I mean, the actual 
the new facility, which is this community center that's being built, we haven't gotten mm -hmm. to the to Kelly Park yet, and we certainly are going to address that balance with respect to organ, organized versus a free play and that sort of thing. I'm just wondering, is there, are there any specifics that have been discussed with respect to the use of this new facility, the pool, the library, the 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 senior center, all, all of that stuff? Yeah, I mean, so I think the library, the public libraries in the United States and, and including ours, you know, have long been pretty well open to all comers, no fees involved. So it's less of a, 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 a issue, I think, in, in the library components. Um, but we'll take the gymnasium, for example. So e even at the former facility, there had been, um, y you know, b before the industrial area kind of became developed into a new tech hub. Um, you know, the, the gymnasium that was there, I think was primarily used by, you know, local residents, you know, who wanted to, you know, play sports in there. And uh, with time, you know, the neighborhood changed with, um, you know, the area being redeveloped, not only with uh, office uses, uh, tech, of course, um, but also new residential. And um, a, a number of, 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 of those sort of new uh, uh, workers or, or, or residents um, were basically using the, the gymnasium to a, a greater extent um, th uh, in, in, to, in such a way that it limited the longtime residents' access to the facility, and I think there's a, a long-standing uh, and and legitimate concern among some of the longtime residents that a brand new facility will be constructed, um, but there won't be a place for them to use it uh, because it'll be for, you know, just to put a a, a blunt point on it. It'll be for Facebook workers. It'll be for folks who are moving in and, and buying these um, homes and properties at prices that we ourselves could never afford. Um, and, you know, we're kind of getting displaced out of the neighborhood. And so that's something that, you know, uh, when we talk about balance, really seeking to avoid, you know, that kind of displacement of, of, our, of some of our residents. Yeah, well said. Yeah, understood. Thank you for the opportunity to talk that through a little bit. All right, it looks like next up, if Commissioner Bryman is, is finished oh. is, oh, one more question? No, no, I just want to lower my hand. <laughs> is uh, Commissioner Brosnan. I just wanted to comment. I don't really have a question. Um, I was really glad to see in the guiding principles that there's a cost recovery policy um, being considered, universal accessibility um, that makes it appear very well thought out and well planned. And um, one thing that I personally would be interested in seeing more about, you know, once it comes to this point is um, the energy efficiencies that are being built into the facility. Um, I think it would be great to get a you know, a bit of a deeper view into that at some stage. Considering that Menlo Park is the first city in America to set a net zero target for 2030. Yes, absolutely. And I, I will tell you, you know, when it comes to the kitchen in the facility, it, we, we had to do a, a little bit of arm twisting with some of our uh, our staff to like say, well, you know, you're going to be cooking with electric <laughs> in this new facility and not gas. But, you know, the benefits are are, are incredible. Um, and to, I think we definitely will bring back a deeper dive on the sustainability features. Um, uh, it's actually one of the key and most impressive elements of this project is how, how forward looking it is as, as far as being all electric, no natural gas, no fossil fuels. Energy is produced on site with solar. It's even recaptured in the microgrid. Um, it, it's quite impressive. And yeah, Menlo Park is definitely on the, on the leading edge on this. Awesome. Well, seeing no remaining questions from commissioners, I think we can move on to 
item E3, the Parks and Recreation Commission work plan update. Oh. I guess I'll hand off to Director Sean Reinhardt again. Yes, more, more of me. Uh, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, so the commission will recall that the commission has been kind of working on updating its work plan uh, for actually the past couple of years. Of course, the pandemic uh, caused major disruptions to all the commissions kind of doing the annual work plan. You may recall that the commissions weren't even meeting for a period of, gosh, five or six months in 2020. So that really upended the process. Um, the commission, uh, this commission and the subcommittee in particular, uh, did great work to revise the, the work plan. So let me just, a little background. Uh, this is in the report, but as of 2020, um, I believe it was by fall, the commission had uh, created th this draft work plan. Um, it was tentatively calendared to go to the city council, I believe in October of 2020, but then the pandemic continued to throw curveballs, and it never actually went to the city council. But as you can see, it was four parts. It was about uh, inclusive programs and services, diverse and changing needs. It was about um, maintaining parks and facilities. It was about class and program offerings, in particular the accessibility and leveraging partnerships and, um, and so on. So then uh, this commission in 2021 kind of went a little deeper with the work plan. So there's two slides here. One is the goals were kind of simplified uh, into these um, six primary goals. And then they were kind of, um, uh, there was some more explication that went around them with some examples that then followed as shown here. So this was presented to the city council in February of 2022 per the usual process. And the purpose of that process is for commissions to create their work plans each year they present it to the city council for any feedback or direction. Sometimes the city council will just accept the work plan. In other cases, they'll provide some feedback and direction. In this case, some feedback and direction was provided. Um, it was provided um, to, to staff outside of the context of the city council meeting. And so I'll um, share it here with you. It kind of takes the form of questions and comments which are paraphrased from the feedback we got from city council members. Uh, first and foremost, with tremendous appreciation for the work that the commission does um, each month and throughout the year um, to advise the council on um, parks and recreation in the city of Menlo Park, and also to commend the commission on the effort and work that was put into the work plan. And because it's such an important commission with such an important um, charge, they didn't wanna just you know rubber stamp. They wanted to give some feedback in particular in light of the MPCC opening. And so um, in looking at the previous work plan, some of these in quotes are sort of referencing specific elements of the work plan. So just to share in, in one of the goals, it mentions expanding park facilities. And the question back was, you know, hey, what exactly does that mean? Can you please describe that a little bit more? It was kind of unclear. And so uh, you know, that was the feedback there. What does that mean exactly? Um, what does neighboring community imply? Um, so, you know, getting a little more specificity around when we talk about neighboring communities, does that mean Redwood City? Does that mean San Mateo? Does that mean East Palo Alto? Does that mean another neighborhood? Just to get a little more specificity around that statement. Um, also define diverse community perspectives. So I think there's a few here that are kind of in the bucket of um, maybe too broad, get a little more specific, there's maybe a little more, too much room for interpretation in some of these statements, um, such a, and some, you know, maybe just could use a little bit more explanation and specifics around what does that mean? Um, diverse community perspectives, I think, you know, kind of spelling it out is, is what the desire was. Um, ensuring that there are relationships with residents throughout the city of Menlo Park. Um, I think that's, that feedback is, sort of, of a piece of making sure to do, take the effort to solicit and include feedback from residents who might, necessar who might not necessarily attend a Parks and Recreation Commission meeting, who you know, might not necessarily engage in some of these traditional means, but to ensure that there's, 
there's some connection with, with those residents who aren't reached that way. Focusing on that input, um, ensuring that all Menlo Park residents are included in the concept of high quality services and programs. I think this references back to some earlier discussion we were just having about you know, the real uh, inequity uh, between you know, different parts of, of town that goes back a long time and persists to this day. Um, uh, back to the field allocation and usage, you know, that's, a, that's a prime example with the athletic fields being programmed very heavily um, for um, you know, organized play for which you know, pretty significant fees exist just to participate. And um, you know, maybe, maybe some resident, more resident input about, is that really what we want? I think we just saw in the, the San Mateo County Parks survey that they did for Flood Park, we saw a pretty hefty percentage wanted more casual drop-in, pick up kind of passive time on, on fields and not to have them programmed quite so much. Um, so I think that's that's of a piece with this feedback. And then um, the pool operations is, is, is also, has been a topic of, of some interest by the city council and community for some time. And I think this goes back to just sort of differences in, in access and, and services uh, from the Bellhaven pool as, as compared to the Burgess pool over the years and wanting to ensure that we've got resident input while we're developing the new pool so that we don't kind of repeat maybe some of the past, you know, sort of um, less than optimal, um, the differences between the two pools. Um, so, so that's kind of a summary of it. Now this is in, in the record and for, for the commission to consider. And as you um, kind of maybe go back and incorporate this into your work plan, hopefully this, um, this feedback will, will help toward that goal. And, and I'm happy to provide any more information that I can based on, on you know, kind of what I have received from the council as far as feedback. Great, thank you so much, Director Reinhardt. Uh, Assistant Director Nick Schegde, do we have any public comments on this item? Thank you, Chair Thomas. If any member of the public would like to make a comment on item E3, the Parks and Recreation uh, Commission work plan update, please use that raise hand button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, or if you're dialing in, press star nine now. And seeing no hands raised for comment, uh, back to you, Chair Thomas. Wonderful. Yeah, you know, I think this feedback is great. I don't think we need to spend too much more time on this item. Um, I think one thing that might have caused confusion originally is uh, we had these six um, goals and then we had the examples. And this is on me. I think both of those ended up um, arriving in front of the city council where it would probably have been better if just the first six arrived, because I think the six explicit examples were, were confusing. And even some of the specific things pointed out about the wording um, were actually on the example section. Um, uh, another thing that would be helpful is if there's any template or maybe perhaps from another commission that we could look at just to, so we have a better sense of of what they're expecting, because it seems like there's some balance here of um, you know, wanting to keep things at a high level as these are kind of thematic goals. Uh, and then on the other hand, um, also wanting them to give them enough detail to where uh, the council feels satisfied. So um, I guess do any other commissioners want to make a comment on this? Otherwise, I think the, the subcommittee, which is myself, Commissioner Bryman, Commissioner Brosnan, um, I think we have enough feedback now to move forward. Okay, seeing no hands raised, um, we can move to informational items. So informational items are transmitted to the Parks and Recreation Commission in staff's effort to provide an update on matters of importance to the commission. Informational items are not action items, however. A commissioner, city staff member, or a member of the public may request to make a comment or ask a good question on any of the informational items. First one is F1, the gym, gymnastic program re reactivation capacity and timeline update. I'll hand it off again to uh, Director Reinhardt. 
And just really quickly, the, the report's there in the agenda packet, and it references, of course, the report that went to the city council. I'll just give an update that last night, the city council did uh, revisit the, the, um, the uh, budget principles and proposed service level enhancements of which the gymnastics reactivation was a part, meaning we were letting the city council know in advance of adopting the budget later this um, in the early summer that we're planning to bring forward the gymnastics reactivation, uh, basically restoring it to the levels that it was before the pandemic. And that if the city, the city council will be asked to authorize the budget for that, the new positions for that with the new budget, which would take effect July 1st. They reviewed that, um, they unanimously approved the entire concept, including the gymnastics reactivation uh, in principle um, last night at their meeting. Now, the actual authorization will take place during the adoption of the city's operating budget, which takes place in June. But this initial indication from the city council was, yes, this is the right direction, include this in the budget proposal, and we'll take it up for adoption when we do the budget. Thank you for the update. Um, Assistant Director Shegda, do we have any public comment? Any member of the public would like to comment on item F1, the informational report on the gymnastic program reactivation capacity and timeline. Please use that raise hand function now. I see one hand raised for public comment. It's Andrea, Andrea, could you give us your first and last name for the record? You can go ahead and unmute yourself and address the commission. Hi, yes, my name is Andrea Brandt um, and I live in Menlo Park. Um, so I was curious about um, what portion of the program you were putting forth in the budget, because I know at one point there was discussion about having potentially a third party contractor take over the gymnastics program. And then I know most recently there was discussion about there being, I think it was five FTEs that would need to be rehired. So um, I was just curious if you could provide some clarification about what your proposal is going to include. Sean, if you want to take uh, that so, one, or I can. So through the through the chair, um, I think typical protocol would be to just, we'll take all the public comments, and then if commissioners want to ask for you know more information based on the comments, we're happy to do that. But maybe just go through that that protocol. Sounds good. Great, thank you for your comment, Andrea. Does anyone else have? Um, comment on item F1, please use that raise hand function at this time. And seeing no other comment on this item, back to you, Chair Thomas. Okay, let's open this up to commissioners. Uh, maybe to kick this off, I will just forward um, Andrea's questions and particularly around, um, you know, because I know contracting this out was discussed in this commission and um, received a, a lot of attention and, and interest. So I'd love to hear um, staff's response on that. Yes, thank you. So the, um, and in the report, it references, you know, some past discussions with the city council because uh, it was a city council report, um, including a proposal back in September to reactivate the program uh, using city personnel, because that's how it was operated before. Um, at that time, the city council deferred action because of the, the uh, surges in the pandemic and because young children could not be vaccinated yet at that time. So they said, bring it back. Um, so it was brought back. Um, and again, last night, the city council, what they considered and basically approved in concept was to um, authorize re-adding those city staff positions to the operating budget to operate the program with, with city staff in-house. At, at, no, at no point in time was staff directed to explore in any detail um, contracting out the program. So, um, you know, the, 
the direction we we basically received last night was continue with the the model of of utilizing city staff for the gymnastics program. Great. Well, thank you for that update and um, yeah, continuing to to uh, you know recruit for these roles. I think I read in the report that um, this was made more difficult um, as. Uh, uh, a staff member with a lot of institutional knowledge retired. But um, yeah, it will be exciting to see those, those programs uh, get revamped and to, to get going again. Seeing no other commissioner comments, I think we can move on. Actually, uh, I'm sorry, Chair Thomas, uh, Commissioner Bryman has his oh. hand up. Commissioner uh, Bryman. Thanks, thanks guys. Um, again, I just, just a further point of clarification. Uh, did the city council approve a budget or did they approve that three people are to be rehired? Like, we, we, thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah. I'm sorry. Were you done? I think. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. They're just that. In other words, are we kicking it down the road a little bit? Is it just sort of a budget in place so as to make that decision in the future? Or is it, no, we are going to rehire three particular positions uh, at the same rate or whatever? Great question. And it is a little complicated. So I'm glad, I'm glad you brought it up so we can clarify. So the city's uh, annual budget process typically extends three or four months. It's a very complicated operation. And so usually that kicks off in the February or March with sort of a review of the current finances of the current fiscal year. And then by the time we get to where we are now in April, there's sort of some initial budget conceptual proposals that start to be produced. In particular, when it comes to like adding staff, adding costs, we give the city council sort of an early heads up of like, here's where we see the needs being based on projects the city council has asked us to undertake. And so the council took no action on that last night. It was more like surfacing it for public view, for the council to see. And then at that point in time, council can say, um, that looks okay, keep going, bring that back to us for approval with the budget in June. Or they can say, hmm, I've got issues with that or I want you to change it. So in this case, they basically said, that looks pretty good, bring that back to us in June, we'll vote on it then. So, so yes, uh, they would be voting on it in June. They did not take a vote on actually adding the staff last night. And the number of staff that were conceptually proposed and that will be brought forward for council approval in June is 5.75 full-time equivalent staff, right? So, so five full-time and one three-quarter time person. Okay, and again, just so I understand, it's, it's the amount of people to be paid directly on, that are on city staff to do that and not necessarily monies that are going to go towards gymnastics. Is that clear? Uh, Is that the case? No, it was, this would be for staffing the gymnastics program specifically. And these are positions that do not currently exist. The entire gymnastics program, all of the staff positions, all of the operating budget um, was eliminated. Uh, as a result of the pandemic in 2020. So in order for us to hire people to operate the gymnastics program, the city council would need to actually authorize the budget and authorize those positions so that, so that we can do that. So yeah, it, it, they don't exist currently. And that's what the request is, is to authorize those positions and the, and the budget to pay for them. Those 5.736 positions previously did exist or they never existed? Yeah, that was the number of positions that were in place before the pandemic and they operated the gymnastics program and that was exclusively what they did. Yeah. They, they did the gymnastics program and that's the proposal now. It's not repurposing existing staff, although I should be clear, now I get where you see where you're getting the three from. Um, when the gymnastics program was eliminated in 2020 and those staff positions were cut basically. Um, a few of the staff actually had certain levels of seniority that allowed them to basically bump or transfer into other available positions so that they could keep working for the city, but in a different capacity, 
right? So they're, so they're not in gymnastics positions right now. They're in various other positions elsewhere in the city. So, so those three folks who do have the institu some institutional knowledge, they still work for the city and they could pretty easily, you know, fill those restored gymnastics roles if they become available and bring that knowledge with them. What Chair Thomas was referring to and mentioned in the report is a really key person, the program coordinator did retire in December. And so that person, uh, that's a really essential position to start the reactivation. Because we lost that institutional knowledge, that means we would have to recruit someone new from outside as opposed to transferring someone from inside. And you know that'll add a little bit more time uh, to what was needed to set up the, to get the program restarted again. Uh, but, you know, I want to be very clear, these positions do not currently exist in the city. They need to be added back by council in order to restart the program. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, assuming Commissioner Bryman um, <laughs> is going to take his hand down, I think we are... Uh, Done with commissioner questions on this item and we can move to F2 department updates. I'll hand it back to staff. Uh, thank you, Chair Thomas. I've got a quick update from the, um, the Bedwell Bayfront Park uh, Earth Day cleanup, which happened last Saturday. Um, the Youth Advisory Committee was sort of leading the charge on that. We had a really great turnout. We had about 45 people show up for the park day cleanup, um, had a really great time. Uh, the, the park is pretty clean. And so it was, it was kind of challenging at some points to find things to, to pick up. I was, you know, I, when I think park cleanup, I'm thinking I'm gonna find, you know, tires and, uh, and, and old oil barrels and things. But, but what, uh, what uh, folks who we were partnering with from, um, from grassroots uh, ecology said that the, the most damaging things were actually cigarette butts and pieces of small pieces of plastic and styrofoam, which get into the food chain um, in ways that other pieces of um, trash don't. So we, we actually uh, took a lot of trash out um, and, and had a good time. Um, they ate all the donuts I brought. So I, I consider that a successful event. So I just wanted to give you guys an update since the uh, since Natalie uh, came in and gave you guys um, uh, some information about that park day cleanup. And then I'll toss it over to Sean and Rondell if they've got any updates they'd like to share with the commission. Okay. Well, thank you for for that update. It's really cool. Um, that you know, that the, the staff supports the youth. Uh, I think it's advisory council. Um, it was really impressive uh, when they spoke with us recently. Um, okay, so I guess. Oh, uh, before we move on, do we have any public comment on this item? Sorry, I was tabbed out looking for my for the presentation that's coming up. Uh, if any member of the public would like to make a comment on uh, item F2 department updates, please use that raise hand button at the bottom of your Zoom screen or press star nine now. And I do see a public comment. It's uh, Alan Bedwell. Alan, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and address the commission. Uh, thank you, Alan Bedwell with our friends at Bedwell Bayfront Park. I just wanted to express our appreciation for Cleanup Day uh, and the work that the city sponsored and with the youth group as well. Um, and it's a testament to the city uh, that uh, the site, the, the uh, park is as, as clean as it is, uh, just given the heavy use. Uh, thank you again for that. Appreciate it. Thanks very much for your comment. Anyone else have a comment to make on item F2, the department updates? Seeing no more hands raised, back over to you, Chair Thomas. Okay, great. Do any commissioners have comments on this update? 
Seeing none, we can move to F3, Parks and Recreation Commission tentative agenda calendar. Hand it over to staff. Thank you, Chair Thomas. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Can everyone see the calendar? Um, so uh, coming up in May, we have a uh, new commission chair and vice chair selection, um, some policy review, um, an update on the aquatics program, and uh, a little bit more of that MPCC operational planning, some of those items. Um, and then uh, also drawing your attention, the commission's attention to that June 22nd, uh, date uh, i believe that's a monday i believe that's the i think the last time we had a joint meeting we met on the normal wednesday of the parks and recreation commission and this uh date is proposed is the third monday of the month which is the normal date for the library commission uh just kind of pointing that out for your attention um these are all of course subject to change depending on the commission's desires um so open it up now for discussion about uh, additions, changes to the agenda calendar. Thank you for presenting the calendar. Do we have any public comment on this item? Uh, if any member of the public would like to make a comment on the tentative agenda calendar for the Parks and Rec Commission, use that raise hand function on your screen now. And seeing none, back to you, Chair Thomas. Okay, do any commissioners have comments on this calendar? Great. Seems like it's appropriate, so we can move on. Uh, before, if, if I may, through the chair, uh, I did hear during the conversation earlier, one, one item to maybe just put on future unscheduled is um, a review of the MPCC sustainability features. I believe it was suggested by Commissioner Brosnan. Maybe we could add that to unscheduled. That sounds great. I think that was a, a great su suggestion by Commissioner Brosnan. I think there'll be a lot of uh, interest in that. Hey, okay. Chair, Chair, Chair Thomas, uh, just uh, for Nick, that 22nd of June is actually a Wednesday. Oh, um, okay. So, yeah. Well, so maybe just, I got it. Maybe I got it reversed that we met on the Library Commission Day last time, and and we're going to meet on the Parks and Rec Commission Day this time. I knew it was one or the other, but I will double check and make sure. Thank you, Rondell. You. Yeah, it's definitely the Wednesday. I remember we had that conversation with the Library Commission last week. We said, yeah, I, think, I think we did yeah. meet on the Monday last time. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Commissioner Diepenbrock. Yeah. So that's a Wednesday then. That's our normal day, I guess, is what I should say. Right. I think we need to put a kudos in the record uh, to Assistant Director Howard for picking up on that. <laughs> um, awesome. Any other comments on this? Seeing none, we can move to commissioner reports. Uh, so the first up uh, is a park tour report on the Bedwell Bayfront Park in Kelly Park. And I'll hand it over to Commissioner Brosnan. Thank you, Commissioner Thomas, and thank you, Nick, for putting together this presentation. It's much appreciated. Um, this is a report um, on the Bedwell and Kelly Parks tour uh, that we took at the end of March. Um, this was led by um, Park Superintendent Bill Halleck. Um, and attended by myself, Commissioner Thomas, uh, Director Reinhardt, and Assistant Director Nick Zegta, uh, and uh, Assistant Director Rondell Howard. 
Um, and we also had a member of the community join us um, who had fabulous questions and was a pleasure to have uh, join us. Um, so we met at Bedwell Bayfront Park um, early in the morning. And um, Nick, I would just like to say it's, it's a breath of fresh air to hear that there was a cleanup project in a park where there wasn't much trash to pick up. Um, it is a really pristine uh, piece of land there. Um, as it says here, 160 acres. Um, it's, it's refreshing to see all this nature in the midst of the city, which we don't get uh, a view of often unless we go out of our ways to you know, drive to a park. Um, uh, you know, a state park or a federal park. This one's really accessible and has fabulous views of the entire Bay Area. Um, it's surrounded on three sides by the Don Edwards um, as a Bay National Wildlife Refuge. It's popular. It's a popular area for uh, birders. Um, we saw a jackrabbit while we were there, which everyone was really excited about um, that ran across our path. Um, we had a bit of a history lesson on the park, which was that this area was originally a landfill um, with the construction completed in the mid 90s. Um, and then it was uh, uh, spearheaded by uh, a former city manager to be converted into a park. Um, it was Mike Bedwell, uh, who had been a city manager for uh, two or three Two, two or three decades in Menlo Park. Um, it's a really beautiful area. It's really peaceful. Um, as it says here, passive recreation use. There aren't a, a ton of uh, man-made facilities in, in the area, which is, uh, again, in my view, uh, uh, a breath of fresh air. Um, and uh, there, we had a bit of an overview on the master plan, which is approved for 2017 to 25 um, on um, some improvements that will, uh, uh, will be occurring at the entrance to the park to give it more of a, a park entrance feel. Um, I believe there's going to be a roundabout at the entrance there. Um, there was uh, some, uh, uh, Nick, maybe you can refresh my memory on this, but the Atherton Channel flood management is uh, is part of the plan. Um, right. As there's well as a improved signage. But. Yeah, there's a there's a flood channel that comes down right along Marsh Road, uh, sort of um, through Atherton, and uh, that 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 channel uh, empties out into a into a facility there, right at near the park entrance. Um, there's also, so there's some work, it was very, uh, very uh, difficult to get all the different agencies together um, to approve the park uh, improvements um, to make that uh, flood channel um, more efficient and more resistant to sea level rise. Um, uh, there's also, uh, Meta has built a new uh, bike and pedestrian overcrossing of the Bayfront Expressway that um, uh, crosses Bayfront Expressway from the Belhaven neighborhood and, and Chilco and, and goes over to the Bay Trail, which runs along the front edge of the park. Um, and so connecting another way uh, into the park. So uh, it, it'll be exciting to see those, those changes come through. Let's see, what happened to my pictures? Hmm. See if the next one works. Oh no, my my beautiful pictures are gone. I think my my computer is acting up up again on me here. Let me uh, stop sharing and see if I can get my display. You can uh, you can keep going, uh, Commissioner Brosnan. My apologies. Um. All right. Well. Um. Uh, so it was a really beautiful morning, great weather out that day, um, uh, a really pleasant catch up and also a good opportunity for some of the staff and commissioners to meet face to face. Um, for me a lot for the first time, I, I reckon for others as well, um, and also uh, to have some members of the community uh, join with us um, and hear some you know, outside perspectives, I think was really great. Um, from there, um, we also had uh, actually in in that park. We also had 
got a bit of a view into some of the history of power usage in the area. There's methane that's produced as a result of the landfill. And, uh, you know, in, a, in earlier times, less populated times, it was used for energy, um, energy production uh, for the city. Um, so you can see remnants of, uh, of these old facilities out there. Um, from Bedwell Bayfront Park, we uh, headed over to Kelly Park, um, which is a much smaller park, um, 8.3 acres. Um, some highlights about this park are that it is the only city owned lighted synthetic field. Um, there's a track, uh, there's a, a, a turf, a astroturf field in the center of it. It's very well lit. Um, it's got two tennis courts and a recent uh, pickleball pilot has begun there. It has basketball courts, um, as I mentioned, the track. And um, you know, we got to see some of the MPCC construction underway. So when we were there, the foundation hadn't been laid yet, but then as, uh, 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 as uh, Director uh, Reinhardt pointed out, the foundation should have would have been laid by now. Um, so the progress is really, you know, zooming on that um, MPCC. Um, yes, thank you. Here is an overview of, uh, of this area um, uh, that is sort of at the crossroads here of the Bayshore Freeway and, um, um, and the, um, the name of that road escapes me at the moment, but uh, uh, the, um, uh, it, it is very, it's in a bit of a compact little corner. Um, you know, some of the issues there, I, I think one of the major issues around the, you know, uh, accessibility of this park is the um, parking is very limited there. Um, so I'm not sure if there's, uh, if there's a, a clear path forward on how, how to address that at this stage. Um, it, it's really popular. I was told that you can see that it's practically empty the day we were there. Um, all the staff were shocked and amazed that it was empty. That's uh, typically not the case. It's usually a very uh, you know, heavily used park. Um, uh, so again, we had a bit of a peaceful saunter around the track, um, had a look at the facilities, and um, it's just really great to have these facilities. Um, we're really lucky to live in a city with such amazing parks and, a, and an abundance of them, uh, and with a, with a staff that really looks after them. My apologies again for my... Uh, my uh presentation shortcomings. Thank you very much for putting that together, Neil. That was great. I'll have a good I'll have a good copy in the minutes so you'll be able to look at it there. Well thank you Commissioner Brosnan. That was a great summary. And I'm excited to hear the next uh park tour presentation on Burgess Park. Um, so I'll, I guess I'll hand it over to Commissioner Joshua and Mr. Chair Baskin's out, so Commissioner Joshua. Commissioner Joshua, I think your audio is off, your mic's off. Sorry about that. Um, so um, what we found, what at least what I found um, really impressive about Burgess Park is the complete facility that that the um, that the city offers the, the community. And we did a very exhaustive tour, which um, included the playground area, tennis courts, the sports field, um, uh, the skate park, the um, gymnasium facility, the buildings that are currently being used for the um, seniors, um, as well as the aquatic facility. And this was a very complete um, tour. What I was really very impressed with is the level of maintenance that is maintained um, of all of the, the, the components in, in the facility. Um, when we went specifically to the, the sports fields, um, the Little League field was uh, uh, newly returfed, and part of that returfing was paid for by the Little League itself. So we're 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 looking at a, a relationship here where we have 
user fees as well as city dollars going in to actually maintain the facility. And I think that's that's very important as a model going forward for um, all of our facilities. So the users are actually contributing, especially when they have the facilities to, to make that, um, that contribution. Uh, the cleanliness of the entire facility, and this is really the jewel of the Menlo Park um, Parks structure, because it has everything in there. It has full recreation as well as full community um, service. Um, I, I think the, the 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 one element that uh, was I wouldn't say questionable, but had a long history behind it, and and uh, I would, I'd say a little bit of a sketchy history is the skate park, and it was sort of alluded to during uh, COVID, where keeping. Uh, young adults out of the area and keeping it clean became a very, very challenging thing and still continues to be a challenging thing. It's, know, it's one of the few community areas that actually has a skate park. And I thought, I thought that was um, that was really unique. Um, when we went into the gymnasium facility, I was, I'm, I was really impressed with the fact that it was so multi-use and that it was used all the time. All of these facilities are used all the time, which means that the money that's been spent on maintaining them is really being, it goes to good use in terms of the community and the actual usage of it. Um, I also found that the $2 access fee for, for pickup was very, very reasonable and it allowed universal access to, um, to that gymnasium uh, facility and that it was used all, all day around and it could be converted from from basketball to volleyball and to other um, court sports um, inside the facility. Um, we then went to a sort of a, a multi-use building which is now also being used for the seniors um, since the community center is, is, is now um, um, uh, being built. Uh, <clears throat> and one of the comments was that this is now being used temporarily as an, uh, um, as a senior center. And the thought is that in the future, there really should be programs at both at the new community center and at Burgess, because there's obviously a fair amount of the senior um, uh, population of the city that is actually using it right now. Some are being bussed in from um, other parts of, of Menlo Park, but I think this is the place where um, uh, that can continue to be used, um, not just as a pilot program, but uh, for, for seniors and the facilities really, really, um, um, allow that to happen. Uh, we, we, we really don't have to add very much to it. The, the kitchen facilities are always already there. The meals can be provided um, uh, both here and at the new, um, the new community center. Um, the area that I think I spent the most amount of time on was the aquatics. And the reason being that it was built 17 years ago and there's been very, very little maintenance on the area. Uh, we looked at both the uh, the surface or the, the deck surface, and you could see that it, it, parts of it were actually becoming unsafe. The um, changing room and washroom areas are very old and really, really, really need to be upgraded. And those are the, the superficial things that you see when you first walk in. Um, the underlying structure of the entire aquatic center is very much in doubt. We went into the, the pump room area where one of the, um, uh, I think one of the filtration units has been recently replaced at $125,000. And there are three more, and each one of them is really close to um, going where, they, you know, and once they go, the entire system, the entire aquatic area shuts down. There's a plan to, to actually do refurbishing of the entire area, which would take the entire aquatic center down for seven to 10 months, and that can be planned. But what can't be planned is if the pumps go down and there's a major disruption, and then we don't know how long it's going to bring, take to bring back up. So it's a case that we start, we need to start to look at spending money on the infrastructure of the aquatic center, we're going to have the aquatic center go down, for a longer periods of time, and it's going to cost a lot more money to bring it back up. So it's 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 a case uh, really where you know just an ounce of prevention is going to really uh, uh, save us in spending a lot of money in the future in in, in terms of, of of future maintenance. And you know when you, when you go into the, the pump room and you see pumps leaking, seventeen years old, and they can't get spare parts for it, when they go they go, and um, and and that's the thing that probably concerns me most about. Um, uh, about uh, Burgess, but my overall impression was that this is, it, it really is a jewel of Menlo Park, and I've gone to, um, to you know, the center of, 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 uh, of recreation facilities in different parts of the peninsula, and I haven't seen anything as good as this. Questions? Wow, thank you, Commissioner Joshua. I guess my first question is, was that presentation all from, from memory? Yeah. 
Very impressive. Uh, it looks like Commissioner Bryman also has uh, a I, I just wanted to suggest that uh, I, I think it's no accident. Uh, Burgess Park is, in fact, city center, quite yeah. literally. That's where our city hall is. That's where, uh, you know, I mean, that is sort of, I, I mean, I don't know about geographically exactly, but it's really the middle of town. And and that's I as it should be. I think that's where we should have our jewel. It should be in a place that is sort of, in that sense, accessible to all or in proximity to all and where, you know, as mentioned, it's it's city center. Um, so I it's nice to hear that 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 is the case. Uh, I I just want to suggest that, again, years and years ago, when I was on the the, the Little League board, in fact, there was some discussion about improvements. And I think the conversation was, hey, look, we do our share. And then we'll ask the city to participate. But that's kind of been the, the, the methodology for a long time is that we're not just asking, we're, we're giving and, and asking sort of matching, as it were. Um, one of the things I was working on uh, back many years ago, in fact, was improvements to not just the field. There was a snack shack thing, and we talked about it being usable for the entire community as a city center Kind of a thing so that it was beyond a snack shack but it was a place where the entire community was comfortable sort of going to and using and such um and i'm hoping that we'll get a chance to discuss that further i i no longer have ties to the little league but i i still have a uh, uh, a lot of my heart in in burgess that's for sure Um, assuming Commissioner Brown is done, uh, I guess one more question on this item. So, so I really appreciate that you, you have brought up this issue with the pumps. So, so maybe perhaps this question is, is for the staff and it's like, um, yeah, I assume this is a known issue, but like if someone wanted to get behind this more and really emphasize this, what would be the appropriate channels? Would that be um, it would be discussing it with, with staff, would it be making public comments um, in, in front of the city council. And it seems like a pretty, uh, you know, you know, ounce of prevention, you know, is worth more than a, a pound of, uh, of cure. It seems like a really good um, return on, on money right now. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, um, Chair Thomas. Um, the we will be looking at um, uh, soliciting bids for operators to run both aquatics facilities, uh, and I'm sure that will come up. Maintenance of the current facilities will come up during that process, um, and also you know we we have an annual uh, contract process with um, with the operator. So maintenance comes up a lot, um, and I'm sure Rondell can speak to, to uh, the, the maintenance conversations that, that he's having with uh, Team Sheeper, our current operator. Um, it's, it, it's tricky because there's a lot of facilities that the city is responsible for maintaining, and they have sort of a plan with the capital improvement um, program about which ones get, get priority. Um, and so that's sort of how that process goes for the city. But uh, I think the point is well taken that you have these older sort of infrastructure supporting this very popular program and um, trying to find ways to, to do things now so that we don't um, sort of suffer those uh, outages uh, is, is, is a point well taken. Um, I don't know, Sean, if you want to weigh in on what you think the best way would be for the commission to sort of support that process or or shine a light on it. Well, um, as we just thank you for that, first of all, um, and as the commission just reviewed in the tentative agenda calendar, I believe the aqua there's an aquatics update scheduled for next month as part of um, the aquatics survey. 
and the uh, preparation for a potential request for proposals for a new aquatics operator um, for the MPCC and the Burgess Pool. And that seems like really the prime opportunity coming up just next month to talk about the facility as well. Okay, great. Um, does anyone else have a, a comment on this item? I was only going to suggest that it, that that's great. Sooner than sooner than later, um, we put it off. We we go through the sort of the machinations of you know protocol and what have you. Next thing we know, it's months and months and months, and then we have to respond to failure as opposed to planning, right? So, are we do we want to respond to failure or do we want to try to sort of nip it in the bud, as they say? But yeah, a month uh, seems reasonable. Is this an operator question or is it an infrastructure question that public works has to handle? Great question. So at uh, Burgess Pool, the it's the city's facility, uh, you know, the physical building. And so the operator really is responsible for operating the programs there. They have, they, have, they have some level of maintenance responsibility, but it primarily falls to the city. Um, you know, the city of Menlo Park has, has you know, dozens of facilities and infrastructure, and all of which is, is basically maintained and managed by the Public Works Department, uh, and not so much the Library and Community Services Department, although as, as the primary users, you know, we, we work very closely with Public Works to um, ensure that the facilities are kept in good repair. In the case of, of uh, Burgess Pool and, and any pool, just because of the nature of like the chemicals that are, you know, in use there, the, the, the type of equipment, the type of use, it can be very impactful um, and very expensive um, to you know, maintain and replace these facilities. So I, th I think Commissioner Bryman raises an excellent point as has uh, Commissioner Joshua, just about that um, sooner rather than later. Uh, and, and there have been quite a few ongoing maintenance and repairs and replacements. I, I, I wanna be clear about that. We've just redid, redid uh, the chemical room. Uh, uh, we're working on the pump room. We're replacing the ADA lift chair. Um, a project coming up um, later this year is renovating the entire lobby, installing better ADA access doors and other pathways in. Um, but it's like a never ending list of, of, of repairs and upgrades to that facility that needs to happen. So, um, but, but it's an excellent point that we, we don't wanna wait for things to fail. Um, the, the pool is, is a particularly challenging facility though, because of all the, just the unique nature of, of, the, of the impacts through the chemicals and other use. Okay, well, we can look forward to discussing this uh, more in a month from now. Assuming there aren't any more comments on this item, we can move to individual commissioner reports. Would any commissioner like to make a short report out on items of interest to the entire commission? Seeing none. Um, Good job, everyone. I think um, we got through a lot today and, and we're pretty efficient. I think we can adjourn this meeting at 8.34 p.m. Thank you all very much. Thank you members of the public for joining us tonight. See you all next time. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.